Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Courtney. I am here with my spouse, Royce, and together we are the Ace Couple. And I am delighted to share with you that we have another phenomenal guest on the podcast today. We'll we'll be talking about a whole bunch of different things, but this is actually a name that perhaps, if you have delved into the kinky side of the Ace community, might be a name that you recognize. So... This will no doubt be a very, very enlightening conversation. So please go ahead and introduce yourself to our pod people. (laughs) Our pod people. Hi, pod people. I'm Evie Lupine. I make kink educational content, and I do that mostly on YouTube. I talk about relationships, polyamory, also asexuality. I'm also ace, that's why I'm here, and I love getting to talk about the intersections of asexuality and kink and how to explore that and maybe bust some myths about that and just maybe open some doors for people that maybe they didn't realize could be open. We are all about opening doors around here, and we really like getting into really nuanced pieces and and just ways to be asexual and ways to live your life as a queer person that don't always get the spotlight. And yeah. I'm I'm sure those who maybe don't know as much about asexuality as our general audience might say like kink and asexuality, how does that go together? And I, I think our audience for the most part, we at least know the basics for sure. But I would love to hear a little bit about your specific experience, what for you was it like to discovering your own asexuality, discovering your place in the kink community, and what was the timeline and how and when did they sort of overlap for you? Yeah, they definitely overlapped a lot. So when I was in high school, I actually dated somebody who was Arrow Ace. And that was my first introduction to the kink community, or not the kink community, the ace community. And I thought for a really long time that I couldn't be ace myself because I wasn't like that particular person. I was like, well, but I really like romance and like I'm not grossed out by sex, uh, so I can't really be like that. But also they were the most similar to me of anyone I really dated. And so that left a lot of confusion. And then it wasn't until I was in college and at that point, like I'm sure a lot of other ace people can relate. I had no natural curiosity about anything regarding sex or masturbation or anything. And I was like, oh, people, people do that? Like, that's, oh, I thought, okay, I thought this was just something we did because, like, we had to. Okay. And so I decided to dive into more general mainstream sex ed because I went to a high school on the East Coast that was very much, like, not full on, full on, like, having sex will kill you, but is of the vein of like, the way we do sex ed is to terrify you with pictures of STIs. And that's like mostly what sex ed is. So I had no idea about like most of the basic things. And so I dove into sex ed in college and like thought maybe if I just learn about it more and I try it and I do all this other stuff, like maybe it'll just click and it'll just happen for me. And I did that for a while and it didn't really do anything. And I had this moment when I was at a house party where it was like classic non-Greek affiliated college house party, there was smoking upstairs, there was drinking, beer pong, all of that. There was rap music going. And I just remember being there. And even though I was invited by people that own the house, I was like, I do not belong here. This is not, (laughs) I do not relate to anyone. Because I could see the dynamics of like, there were people who were there to like get drunk and have a good time. And there were people who were there to like try and find a hookup totally valid do hookup culture stuff let's like as long as consent's there that's what i care about and i was just having this moment of feeling very alien i was like what's going on here and then i think i watched ash hardell's like the abcs of ace video series or something Mm. very similar to like that like era of ace content online and i realized that it wasn't just this one very particular example of asexuality that i saw it was like there's demi and gray a all the other labels and i was like because i don't even think like demi was even around when i was in high school as a label like what that was like 20 
2015, I think, or something when that, that came out. But anyways, I discovered the label of Grey Ace and, like, the whole spectrum of, like, sex repulse to sex indifferent to sex favorable. And I was like, oh, this is me. I just didn't realize there were so many options under the umbrella. And while this was also happening, I also discovered the kink community around this same time, just, like, on this whole exploration of things i had someone recommend to me what is called like a sex positive space which is like kind of code word for a, at least where i live a lot of the nonprofit organizations that run like public bdsm dungeons where you can go to a party and learn stuff and say oh you, could, you should go there because they have these nights and you can learn stuff and i ended up finding one of those centers near me and i went to a party after talking to some people that i knew from the internet that were going and like that all sort of happened right around the same time and so i think because of that there wasn't ever a lot of tension between my identity as an ace person and also being kinky because they just kind of popped up at the same time and I'm, of course these go together because they kind of always have been that's so interesting that your early sort of foray into sex education sort of sounds reminiscent of my experience in a way just because well rice and i were both Midwesterners, and we had varying levels of sex education as well. But we definitely, I, I, I've talked before on here, I definitely had the like, here's a slideshow of the worst possible case scenarios for all these STIs. And you don't want that, do you? So my sex education was nothing whatsoever to speak. But as an ace individual who really, I love knowledge, I love learning about a variety of different things. So it, Sex education for me is such an academic interest before anything, because I yeah. personally have not had the the physical inclinations myself. So it's it's sort of like, let's let's just learn about this from a from a an educational standpoint. What what do other people feel that I don't? <laughs> yeah. For me, I feel like an anthropologist sometimes, or I'm like, I'm exploring this culture that's not mine, and I'm like fascinating people do this and this amazing i want to know more about why that happens and it's it's interesting as well having that outside perspective because i feel like it helps you be more critical of like certain behaviors and understand like oh maybe like consent's important and maybe like as i run into people a lot like because i do kink education consent is so foundational to that that kind of go, oh, but like asking ruins the mood and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, I don't care about ruining the mood. There is no mood. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, just ask. And you know what re really ruins the mood? Violating somebody's boundaries. So why don't we just ask? So Yes, <laughs> hard agree. You, you mentioned Demi at one point being something you weren't particularly aware of. I am really glad that there's a lot more education coming out. We actually just very recently covered a horrible, horrible article that was attacking demisexuality and saying, oh, demisexuals are all just afraid of sex. And oh, so I think I saw that. Yeah. Did you? Oh, it was mm -hmm. dreadful. So uh, of course, there are still misconceptions out there. There are always going to be the haters. But the history of demisexuality, I mean, the word sort of entered the the niche ace communities pretty early around 2006. But it oh, really... Oh, okay. It didn't get a lot of mainstream attraction until I, I started seeing it pop up maybe around 2011 more often as things were, you know, just getting getting a little more out there. And I think that's what's so important about education across all places of the queer experience. And I'm curious because I'm I'm very, very familiar with how education has blossomed over the years for ACE content. But what has that sort of looked like for kink education? I, uh, it's very interesting. I may mean, go back to even like pre-internet days of kink education, but online specifically, at first, I think the most introduction that people had were folks like Lacey Green or the channel Sexplanations. And they did kind of like intro, like, you know, 2010 era, like four minute long YouTube videos of like, this is what BDSM is. It's like so snappy and it's so quick and like you don't really get a lot of meat in that. It's just sort of like the overview of the basics of what BDSM is and like what the acronym stands for. And that was most of what sort of got any level of success on YouTube. I like YouTube channels 
are created and then get abandoned on such a regular basis, I don't feel confident saying that there was no one really else before that or even since then. It maybe just didn't get traction and never really got any kind of attention. But sure. I really think it was like for for YouTube stuff, me and then two other creators, Morgan Thorne and then Watts a Safe Word, uh, Pup Amp, Mr. Christopher on that channel. I think it was really kind of us three and then another YouTuber who doesn't make BDSM content anymore, we all started kind of making videos around the same time from different perspectives. It's funny because like almost all of us, the three I just named, were all on the ace spectrum because uh, Mr. Christopher's not, but Pup Amp is Demi and is a gay man. And then the other person, Morgan Thorne, is I think asexual or I don't know if they're gray or just asexual or like what label they use exactly but we're all somewhere on the ace spectrum so like almost all the kink education on YouTube is like actually kind of being ran by people on the ace spectrum which I think is really interesting but yeah we all started kind of making videos simultaneously of just like intro stuff about like how do you do this thing what is this thing you know and I, I don't really know why we all came up with that kind of around the same time but I think we must have all noticed that there was because that was my motivation for it is I was looking for information about kink on YouTube in the same way that I had for Ace stuff, and there just was not anything. And most of, at least at that time, there were some books, but a lot of it was like behind paywalls, and you had, like, you already had to know people to know people. And these days, like, if people want information, they're not doing like deep dive Google searches unless they're really invested. If they want a quick answer, they're going to TikTok or YouTube. And so this I found was a really good way to reach people that were sort of in that beginning stage of like, I don't even know where to look for stuff, but maybe YouTube. <laughs> and yeah, that was sort of the beginning of a uh, kink education on YouTube. That was probably seven, eight years ago, I probably want to say is when that all started to take off. Fascinating. Now, you you did mention a name that at least doesn't immediately ring a bell, but I I have heard of what's the safe word, and I I did I do think I knew that someone involved with that was also ace because I've also kind of noticed that there are a lot of like publicly ace and kinky people, and one thing that just sort of as someone who's not involved in the kink community myself, I I would say I have some really deep, even long running back to childhood inclinations toward certain kinky things. But it's never for me been a sexual thing. And it's it's been kind of, again, another academic interest, something that I'm I'm curious to see what what other people are interested in and why and how they get involved. But one thing I've noticed a lot of the asexual and kink education that's out there that I've been exposed to personally a lot of it is on the more sex favorable side to use the asexual community term or or potentially sex neutral. I personally and and please tell me if there's anything out there. I haven't seen a lot that seems to be geared towards more sex averse, more sex repulsed aces and kink. Mm. Have you seen much or had conversations? I, I wouldn't say I, I've seen stuff that's like geared strictly towards only sex repulsed asexual individuals. And I think that's kind of a function of the fact that like, at least for my content, like I'm not only speaking to an ace audience, like my community is pretty diverse in terms of their attitudes about sex. And I, I do have people in my community that are sex averse or sex repulsed. And that sort of leads to me kind of needing to walk this middle road of like being inclusive towards like you don't have to enjoy sex or want sex or ever include anything sexual in your BDSM. But also a lot of people do enjoy it for sexual reasons. And I, for example, I know a lot of dominant women that are also asexual and like the way that they can enjoy sex with a partner or at least like find it acceptable enough to want to engage in it on any level is because they're dominant and they get to control every single aspect of what that looks like. Or even things that like I think this is interesting because I've, I've talked in videos about like how being part of the uh, BDSM community like I don't know how to phrase this because I don't I don't want to come across like I've like I healed something that was wrong with me but like I used to be much more sex repulsed and I like didn't like I almost vomited the first time I ever saw a penis in real life like I had to run to the bathroom <laughs> like I was like that should have been a signal like honestly I don't know why I didn't take more stock of that happening but uh, I 
I was was very much like sex or pulse. I didn't want to be around any of it. But being in the BDSM community and like seeing nudity and things in like a neutral context where it wasn't just about sex, but they were bodies that were just like existing and being bodies. And they had you know, all different types of people, all shape sizes, everything like that. That was really like good for me from like just a, a having more positive feelings about my own body, I guess, but then also like not being actively you know, freaked out at the idea of like seeing somebody's genitals because I knew that I could like at least, at least exist in the same space where they vaguely were, even if they weren't like directly interfacing with me in any right. way. Um, but yeah, I started to like watch, like walk this line of like being neutral about sex because I have a more diverse audience. And also, and the reason I, why I brought up that original point was because I wanted to say like, there's a lot of things in BDSM that depending on like your degree of aversion to sex or genitals could fall under that umbrella of like kind of sparking your aversion towards something or it could be a neutral thing. Like, there's a lot of BDSM play that can involve genitals. Even for people that are not asexual in BDSM, there it's not processed in a sexual way, but it does use the genitals as like a tool essentially. Like in the same way that like, you know, okay, well you can hit somebody on their back, but like another place you can hit them is on the breasts. And that might be sexual for some people, but it not, might not be for others. So it's sort of like a confusing, like mishmash of how you even define what certain things are, like if certain things on the body or about people are inherently sexual to you or not. Right. That's one thing that I've found it's very difficult to translate in conversations like this is because the difference between the word sexual or sensual or in other terms, like outside of sex or BDSM, sometimes trying to delineate sexual versus romantic versus platonic or aesthetic attraction, like yeah. th those can be very personal words and they don't always translate directly in conversation without really getting into what you experience or what something feels like to you. Yeah, when I'm having conversations with other people, I I almost always find myself, at least lately now that I've come to understand this, uh, needing to ask, like, what is your definition that you're using? Because what I've noticed is that when you start talking about things that are sexual or sensual, everybody who talks about it from their own perspective often assumes everybody is on the same page with them and that they also yeah. know what that means. And I find that that is very rarely the case because everyone has their own personal backstory and their own connotation with certain things. And when you get into things like kinks and fetishes, you know, there are definitely fetishes out there that are very sexual to some people, but are completely neutral to to others. Yeah, absolutely. Like I it's and this is what I struggle with when I try to talk to a broader like range of people that are not ace about like the fact that you can be into BDSM and not enjoy it for sex on any level. And like it's just about like the sensual part of it or the aesthetic part of it, even for certain aspects of it, where that can mean a lot of different things. But a lot of people have difficulty untangling, especially if they're not ace, like, OK, how is this different from this thing? How like what? Like, isn't this just another way of saying this? Like, there's a lot of people who just straight up don't believe <laughs> that like BDSM isn't sexual at all ever. And that, like, if you say it's non-sexual for you, you're, like, deceiving yourself or you're, like, broken in some way or you're, you, like, I, like, I don't know. People just say the wildest stuff, but it's the internet, so everyone's going to share their opinion no matter how wild it is, I suppose. Yeah, well, that's something that we see a lot with Ace Erasure in particular and just sort of society's broader compulsory sexuality. They think that yes, this is inherently sexual and you are just lying to yourself and everyone else. You're just repressed. Like those are the things that I hear time and time again come up. But the the situation is just so much more complex and changes on an individual level. Because any, any of the interests that I have had that get into the realm of kink, I have never had even the slightest hint of it feeling sexual to me or or experiencing it in a sexual way. And like I said earlier, some some of them for me actually just went back to weird little I I guess you could say awakenings, but it was it wasn't a sexual awakening. It was just a like, huh, that's that's interesting to me. Just the weirdest things like um <laughs> playing one of the very first Mortal Kombat games and one of the one of the 
stages in the arena just had like women who had like ropes around their wrists and and were just oh. tied up spectating. And there was just a moment to me where I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> it wasn't mm-hmm. very yeah. sexual, <laughs> but but then even when I started identifying as asexual, I, I was in not kink specific scenes, but I was in some goth scenes and there there are in some places some overlaps between the goth community and the kink community. And I, I would go to goth clubs where they would have like a fetish night or even even some clubs where most nights they would have sort of a, a back room or a back corner where, you know, different scenes were playing out. And I found myself sort of up until the point of nudity, like I could just sit and spectate and watch, you know, someone get saran wrapped to a pole and <laughs> th- things of that nature. And just as a spectator totally removed from that, I do find it very interesting. I don't personally experience anything sexual whatsoever to it, but sort of the pattern lead up, it's like I'm I'm feeling the same sort of interest as I did when I was you know, much younger playing Mortal Kombat. (laughs) Yeah, it's sort of that like fascination of like, ooh, like what's that over there looks so interesting. And I think it's funny you bring up the goth community because I feel like there's always this like, there's this tension in like goth scenes sometimes about like, not all goths are kinky and like people making assumptions about like because you dress a certain way that that means you're sexually loose and available and of course you get that oh my god you get that all the time on like fat life is the main social media platform for people that are kinky it's like kinky facebook basically and you get a lot of people that are like oh yeah i want a hot kinky goth girl and it's like oh lord in heaven why like just leave me alone like it's funny because like none of the kinky goth girls are gonna want you if you just like go around being like i'm hunting for you because you fulfill this very niche fantasy idea I have about a person I haven't even met yet and yeah there's some overlap but I find at least where I've I've lived it's mostly been relegated to like like you said like there's a back room or there's a performance or something and I've wanted to do something like have like an EBM night or like have like a cyber goth night at a BDSM club because I feel like that would be really fun because I think the music is like very energetic and I think it would it would vibe with kink stuff well but yeah it's a all the different intersections happening at the same time. Yeah, well, uh, tell me about it. I mean, as as someone who who has been in goth scenes and is rather well endowed, but also very asexual and more on the sex repulse side of things, like the number of times people have been like, oh, big titty goth girlfriend. Like, absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not because that's another thing too i'm like my breasts are just my breasts i can't handle like i i can't help it if you perceive them sexually but they aren't sexual to me so if i'm wearing something low cut this is just how my body looks and this is just the dress i am wearing today yeah sometimes you don't want to have like sweat all over your body on a hot day and like having a v neck cut top is the most logical choice like it's not about alluring the opposite sex with your feminine wiles or like whatever the hell like people frame it as being Oh my gosh, absolutely. It's actually, it's also funny that you brought up FetLife. Royce, you you were on FetLife and I was on FetLife before we met each other for like oh. all, all of a week, maybe. Mm, we, we didn't yeah, last long. Yeah, it's not repulsed friendly as a website, I would say. We mentioned this in another podcast episode very briefly. I think neither of us had the right picture in mind of what it is. You just called it like kink Facebook. Mm-hmm. I came on to FetLife after having been like on dating sites for a while. Uh, and so I, I was looking more for like a, a no. potential one-on-one connection, not a community. And I got in and immediately saw how things were going there. And I think I removed the account like two days later, maybe. Yeah, I feel like maybe I should, if we're going to talk about FetLife for the audience before they go run to sign up for an account, maybe I should clarify <laughs> a few things. Uh, so FetLife has definitely changed over the last, I would say, half a decade. It's it's changed a lot in terms of like how people use it and what people use it for. Kind of the baseline's the same. It's not a dating app. It's not a dating website. If you go there expecting to meet someone on the website and talk to them on the website, it's not going to happen because the dynamics are very similar to a lot of dating apps, but people aren't there to date. And so they're just going to ignore you. Like if you try to one-on-one message a stranger and it's like anyone on the spectrum of even seeming like a woman, even if you, even if you're not a woman and you post pictures of women on your profile, you are going to get 
endless contact from people that are like, hey, baby, what's up? Like, and it's, it's really not really not good for that. The way that I tell people to use FetLife and kind of why I frame it as kinky Facebook is because it's a really good place to connect with people you've met at events you find on FetLife. Because this is where most, because like Eventbrite and Facebook themselves are not typically very friendly to kink events and they tend to get shadow banned. And so it's really the main place that people can advertise like, hey, I'm having a party at my house or we're having a meetup at this bar and grill or there's an event going on at this dungeon. Like here's where it is. Here's like the time it is. And it's really, really good for that. And then connecting with people you meet through there, because a lot of people don't feel comfortable like giving out their cell phone number or their other maybe more public vanilla social media profiles to people they just met once at a BDSM party. And so it's good for that. But unless you like, I would say the most successful experience I had on FetLife was because I was still in university. And so I was in a college town. And because of that, almost everyone that I met on FetLife initially were people who went to my school and like, that is very different than like being 32 in Chicago and like trying to meet random people like on FetLife you've never known before. So it's kinky Facebook, but also there's a lot of nudity, a lot of penises, a lot of people doing sexy stuff. And if that's like not your jam, don't go to the front page. Don't really, <laughs> don't really interact with photos. I will say like they, the browsing experience, because for the most part, they make like if somebody likes a photo, the photos that you get like in a, like so and so like this photo it's like a tiny square on your feed of information that like activity you get on your homepage, and so it's easy to kind of like look past it and I'm just an expert at this point I'm like I see a photo I'm skimming I'm looking for it's articles and and things like that I like it for that mostly as people do really really great uh introspective interesting writings about different kind of niche topics and it's really the only platform that you can easily post long form written content that's not like a fan fiction website or like somebody's personal Patreon or something like that. So that's my fat life spiel. That makes sense. Yeah, because for me, I mean, when I, I my very, very brief and failed stint was, I mean, it had to be a decade ago at this point, I want to say probably 10 years on the dot. <laughs> and the area I was into, it wasn't especially active. There were some yeah. people who seemed to already know each other. Mm hmm. And what prompted me to go on was sort of, I, I, I sort of remembered this a bit too, when you mentioned that there are some people who, for example, uh, dominating is sort of the venue for being able to engage in and enjoy sex for, for some folks. Mm -hmm. I had had no interest in anything sex whatsoever. But at, at the time, I had a queer platonic partner who was very sexual, was polyamorous, had just like a, a lot wider <laughs> experience than I did in a variety of different relationships. And she had so sort of noticed that I did have some incl inclinations towards some kinkier things. Uh, I mean, we, the two of us at the time, like, don't, don't do this. We were very bad. We, we did not have the proper education at the time and we were making bad choices, but we, we would like do very, I guess, bad versions of blood play. <laughs> like blood blood was an interest of mine very, very lightly so. But so she she knew those things about me, but also knew it was very much not sexual. And so she said, well, and I, I, I was lamenting how difficult it is to date as an asexual who is on the sex repulse side of things and didn't have an interest in doing that with other people. And she sort of had the the opposite thing where instead of kink could be an avenue for you to enjoy something more actual sex, more potentially general genital related, she thought, well, maybe you could meet someone who is interested in kinky things for which the kink that isn't necessarily, you know, penetrative sex, for example, could be a sexual experience for them. And that could be a way that you could both sort of meet in the middle to um, to explore these different sides of yourself without crossing anyone's boundaries, which I found very interesting at the time. And and she recommended Fet Life to me, so I was like, "Oh, okay, well, I'll do that." But yeah, I no, <laughs> I was also I was also brand new to the internet. I had not met anyone online at this time, so that was not an a good introduction to trying to meet people online for my no. personal experience. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I would. I mean, at that point, like I by the time I joined Fet Life, I was like 2015, 2016. 
I like I'd been all over the internet. I had like I played MMOs. I had like friends in guilds. Like I had I was very experienced with like Instagram, other forms of social media. So I knew kind of what to expect from strangers online a little bit. But if like the first time being on a platform like that, Fet Life is certainly that is it was a lot. Maybe not even <laughs> that's like beyond going into the deep end. <laughs> it was a lot. And then, Rice, what what was it for you that was was it just general curiosity and trying to figure yourself out that brought you to that point? Oh, I, I think so. I was aware that Fet Life existed for quite a while. I didn't know much about it, but I knew it was there. And just trying to meet people, I thought, hey, maybe this is a, a different avenue. I I've had kink inclinations, I guess, forever, which is something I was kind of curious about because I didn't know. I've never tried to look up statistics of how many, you know, young children have, you know, dreams or things like that that are, in in hindsight, very clearly kink aligned. But I've had some that I can remember going back probably to three or four, like as long as I've had memory, that are are very clear. They're, They're much more recognizable for what they were like now. It was just kind of odd being, you know, four or five and having a dream and being like, well, that was kind of weird, but also interesting. I don't really know why that happened, but it's also, I wasn't going around kindergarten being like, so I had this dream last night. Does anyone else do this? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. But I guess a big part of discovering my sexuality or my place on the asexual spectrum has been sort of researching and looking into kink things and figuring out where I, I fit there. After I started dating and started having sex, it was very clear that I wasn't heteronormative. But at at one point, I think I was at a point where I was thinking, well, I'm either some sort of asexual or I'm just definitively non-vanilla and I haven't figured that part out yet. And I guess maybe it was a a mixture of the two. I, I have trouble separating those aspects because they've, you know, they've been a part of how I felt about things for as long as I can remember. Yeah, I think a lot of people, like, it's interesting we, we brought up the dream and just be like, that was interesting. Because I feel like that's a lot of ace people's experiences if we have, like, anything close to, like, a fantasy. It's like, oh, that was interesting. We don't do anything beyond that. We don't think about it in, like, a sexual way. It's just like, oh, hmm, interesting. Need to research that more. What's that about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder if that's why so many aces in the kink community do end up taking sort of an educator role much like you did and some of the others you (laughs) you've talked about before because do you think that your sort of experience with coming into the kink community does differ tremendously from the average allosexual or do you think that there's a lot more in common than someone might expect do you mean like my experience like why and how i got into kink or like what I do actively like for kinky stuff and like my experience of it mentally being different than other Oh gosh, people. I mean we we could go into all of it if if you have the time and w- are willing to share cuz I yeah. for me I I think you you did share a little bit about how you started to learn about it a bit but I think a lot with just not even necessarily kink-related stuff, but even just what is queerness and what is my attraction and what's the difference between sexual and romantic attraction and is this aesthetic attraction. I feel like aces have a tendency to really need to do a lot more introspection than, than the average person does because we're sort of trying to untangle what the different things mean because there's such a dissonance between how other people seem to be experiencing something versus the way we do. And, and I am uh, curious how that fits in with uh, certain aspects of kink. I think that definitely happens. I think a lot of ace people go through that like process of like, first I thought I was bi and then I thought I was pan and then I realized I was actually just ace. (laughs) And like, that was very much my experience. And like, even now I kind of go, because I also experience romantic attraction because I'm not arrow ace. And so like, I definitely have that component of like, well, I definitely experience romantic attraction to these sorts of people and these sorts of people, but where does that fit in with my general label? But I'm happy to answer that whole question. So from my observation, how people get into the BDSM scene is very varied. There's a lot of people who they know they're kinky from like almost day one. Like they're like three years old tying up their Raggedy Ann dolls and like, (laughs) you know, they love being the cop and like cops and robbers and they just like they have just a natural inclination towards 
like power and control and things like that where like when they become an adult or they look at porn or something they go oh I like that that's for me and they just they go with it their whole life and I find that if we're talking about like I, I can't speak to every possible identity but my observation is for cis women that are submissive a lot of them end up finding it I think these days through like fan fiction especially if they kind of have that like tumblr like moment of awakening when they read something they're like oh this is hot i like i want to can i do this in real life but like and then that sort of sparks an interest that leads to kind of going down more of a pathway or, or they even have like the, for me like how i got into it was i had sort of the hmm, that's interesting like variety of asexual fantasy that was uh, like sort of BDSM related and I just didn't know that people did BDSM in real life I thought it was like people think about this and they talk about it in movies but it's like fantasy in the same way that like sci-fi is a fantasy like it's just a cool idea to think about but no one really does it and then I was eventually dispelled of that notion <laughs> and there's a lot of people who get into it through like uh, their own fantasies and fan fiction. And I find that for a lot of uh, cis men and like why I think I have the most difficulty relating to like sexually oriented dominant cis men is a lot of them get into it through like pornography consumption and like finding something in that that they that's part of BDSM they find hot and then like getting into BDSM from there. So not everyone, but like that's my observation is a lot of people start with sort of the, you know, more mainstream adjacent BDSM pornography and then that turning into like well I like to try this in real life with a partner and then eventually it goes from there but then once you actually get into the BDSM community and you're going to events or trying stuff with, out with partners I find that the main difference I have with people it's actually not really that big honestly uh, I think the main thing is that like I have to be very firm with people that like this is not about sex for me this isn't a like oh if we get into a relationship like or if we do this one thing and it's like no there's not a magic button or like combination of things you can push that's gonna like make the sex happen it's just like I this process for me is a mental and emotional journey and it's not about genitals and if you want that like I'm not gonna be the person for you like go, there's a million other people in the world go find one of them to do this with that's not me and I think a lot of other people um even if they don't process it in a directly sexual way so there's a there's a term in the BDSM community it's a little bit older this is from like I want to say the 80s or the 90s called leather sex and the term is a reference to the leather community which is kind of the forefather of the whole BDSM community there's a whole history there we can go into but it's a way of talking about how BDSM even if genitals aren't involved because this is the, the surprising thing I think a lot of people that are ace and in general maybe wouldn't intuitively think about is like going to a dungeon you do not typically see people having genital intercourse you will sometimes see vibrators you will sometimes see oral sex but for the most part you don't see PIV or PIA you like that is fairly uncommon most people who do that either do it after they go home or like behind a curtain area like a mattress like it's not like a public like, public sex can be part of it for some people but for like people who are into BDSM for BDSM sake and are not there for just like the voyeurism or the exhibitionism of it um the actual act of having genital intercourse is not typically on on the menu directly for a lot of people even if they do experience it sexually like mentally and so leather sex is a way of thinking about BDSM as like being something that is like arousing and sexual and like motivating in that way without actually touching anyone's genitals or having genitals involved. And I think a lot of people that do BDSM, even if they don't do it for sex or as part of sex, process it that way. Actually, I have a video I'm working on for my YouTube channel. It's probably going to come out in a couple weeks where I talk about like, I think it's, I came up with like the seven or the eight different levels of like ways of experiencing sex in BDSM from the range of like fuzzy handcuffs in the bedroom on like a you know on your anniversary to like everything in your relationship sexually arouses you and like the whole premise of the relationship that you have built is around like this thing being inherently erotic so there's like a whole spectrum of of ways that people get into it but I find it's more like the the mental processing of it tends to be different which is like subtle and hard to have conversations about but even then like people that are not ace a lot of times even for them they don't experience bdsm in a sexual way at all it's about like the physical mental and emotional aspects of it and like the sensuality of it or the aesthetic part of it as well and i think this is actually a really good tool to use when i try to talk about asexuality to other people is like especially in the kink community you're like hey you know how you like it when bob vlogs you 
but you're not like sexually into Bob and Bob's not into you that way. It's just like fun and it feels good. That's what it's like for ace people too. <laughs> like, you know, and it ends up being a little bit more relatable that way. So I hope that answers your question. That was a really long answer. Yeah, no, that was great. There was, I really like how you pointed out that you you do have to have conversations in your own experience where you're saying, this is what this is for me. And if that's not going to work for you, then then this isn't the right arrangement. Have you personally experienced, you know, having that conversation with anyone who had like a real issue with the the asexual side of it for you? Or are people that you've interacted with pretty, pretty cool about that and understanding? Um, I think I've experienced a range of reactions. I would say that process of knowing to do that was a process of trial and error because uh. originally I would just tell people like, no genitals, like don't don't touch me here, there, wherever. Uh, this isn't going to end in sex. And people would be like, okay. And I realized that wasn't detailed enough. I, it wasn't good enough for me to not like to just say, I'm not going to touch your junk. Don't touch mine, etc. I had to be specific about it's because people would say, oh, yeah, I can do that. No problem. And because they were still mentally processing it as a sex act for them in their heads, they were kind of keeping it away from me. But like, there's something about and you maybe experienced this in other ways, like, Something about the way they were interacting with me and the way they were touching me or looking at me, even if they weren't doing things that were sexual or on my genitals, it still felt sexual. And that was too much. I was like, no, 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 I don't mm, No, not for me. So I, I had to kind of drill down into like, this is not about sex. If you play sexually or the primary enjoyment of BDSM for you is about sex, like we're not going to be compatible. And I've had people that I think maybe not the best actors who will go, oh yeah, that's totally fine. And it's because they just want to be able to play with you and they don't really care about what they have to say to make that happen. Like they're like, <laughs> I yeah. mean, in their head, they're probably thinking something like, "I girls say that all the time. They just don't want to be easy. And so I'm sure when I get her in that moment, she's going to blah, blah, blah. Right. And I'm not saying everyone's that way, but like there are certain people that are that way where that's sort of their MO is like, do whatever you have to do to get to a yes. But the most friction I've had both in my vanilla or non-kink life and also in my kink life has been people that for a relationship dating me are like upfront okay with the premise of me being asexual and like not really enjoying sex and not really wanting a lot of it and not doing this that and the other for sex reasons and I I find that people are oh yeah that's totally fine I get that like thanks for telling me like you know sex isn't really that important to me or whatever or like I'm poly and so a lot of people will just be like, oh I'll have sex with other people and then almost always like between six months to two years into a relationship I would say it starts to cause friction and tension about like but why don't you want to have sex with me and it's like podcast listeners I am making gesticulations about pointing at like a thing <laughs> on a wall uh, because it was like. This is on, this is part of like, I did not, this is not a tricky, tricky, I'm going to get people to date me and then spring it on them later. Like, no, this is, I was very upfront. And I think a lot of people, and this is, maybe we'll get into a conversation about talking about like neutrality about sex and how that plays into a larger uh, discussion on the asexuality spectrum, because I find a lot of people, if I have sex with them at all, then are a surprise when I'm still ace and like, but why don't you want to have sex with me? Mm. I like, we can mm -hmm. have sex, but why don't you want it? And it's like, because that's not how my fucking brain works. Like, yeah. I don't know how to explain it to you. Like, I just like, I look at you and I might love you and I might, might be romantically into you and be thinking about our next date and cuddling with you when we watch the finale of the Great British Bake Off. But I'm not thinking about like, Damn, I really like it. It's funny because I try to impersonate. I'm like, why would that even sound like, yeah, I'm really into touching your penis. Like, I don't, <laughs> like, I don't even know like, how I would phrase that. That is such um, an ace mood. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm, very much the ace mood. So that, that's been my experience is a lot of people, like either because we're dating in a vanilla context or have some kind of kink relationship that like, they're like, oh, well, like, but we did this thing. What do you mean you're still, like, they don't literally say, what do you mean you're still ace? But the the essential part of it is like they have trouble parsing. She did this sexual thing for me slash with me that time. And so I thought I was the special exception, right? Uh. Why am I not? Like they sort of think it's, it almost reminds me 
not fully because I don't want to equate these, but it reminds me almost of those guys that are like convinced they can date a lesbian and make her not a lesbian anymore. Like it's like- I can fix you. I can change that. They just haven't had good penis yet. They just haven't had whatever. You yeah. haven't met the right penis. You haven't done mm-hmm. it with me. Like, oh. Exactly. Like I- It's listen, not so pervasive. Mm-hmm. It's everywhere. It's very sad because it's like, no, and that's part of the advantage- I had of being in college and getting to experiment I didn't really have like sex in college with people but like I got to experiment and see other people doing stuff and like I had lots of relationships and at this point like I've I've had lots of opportunities to have sex with lots of different people and like I've been around the block I've seen and done a lot of stuff and like it's not that there's like one special thing that you need to do to press the button and activate that like it's just not for me like don't hold your hope on that like not gonna happen yeah and far too many people yeah either don't really internalize that or they're still holding on to a hope that something might change at some point i haven't had things that were necessarily spoken about in as explicit terms as like but why don't you want to have sex with me but i did have a partner at one time 12 years ago a dozen years ago (laughs) um at this point who we did, unfortunately. I mean, we were we were younger. We were in some really questionable social circles. So we did just have some people that were really awful. But, you know, he was a bit of a bigger guy. And I experienced almost no aesthetic attraction. I experienced no sexual attraction. And I always thought everybody was just so vain every time someone was like, oh, but you're so hot. Why are you with him? Or, or like, oh, you, you, oh like, yeah. like, you're so out of his league. And like, I felt uncomfortable with those. But for as uncomfortable as I was, it had to have been so much worse for him, too, because, you know, he, he didn't have the greatest self-esteem. But I think my asexuality a, a year or so into the relationship did kind of end up being an issue because... I was like, well, I I love spending time with you and I want to spend more time with you and I want to foster this relationship and we have fun together. But there was sort of an aspect of like, but are you attracted to me? (laughs) But are you attracted Mm. to me? And it's like, it's not because I think you're not my type. Like, that is not the thing. Like, I I could have Brad Pitt next to me and I would feel exactly the same way about him as I do about you. And it's almost like that was not believed almost as if I was the one who was just trying to lie to spare his feelings. So there are definitely some hangups that I think some people have around asexuality where if they don't really, really get it, they'll start to take it a bit personally at some point. Yeah. Like it's, it's not like, Oh, I don't like you and you're ugly to me. And like, why don't you, why don't you like me? What about this? It's like, no, it's not about you not being hot enough to me. This isn't, this isn't like yes. a threshold of hotness where like the asexuality barrier gets broken and that's not there anymore. Like you said, like even with Brad Pitt, like for me, I would feel even less attractive with Brad Pitt next to me because there's no, I have no connection to Brad Pitt. Who's the, f- like, I don't even know what Brad he? Pitt looks like. I just, yeah. <laughs> I just know that that's one of those sex symbol names that people say sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if I tried to draw him, I'd like, I'd probably accidentally draw like one of four other guys in Hollywood. <laughs> I'm really good at recognizing voices. I am like, like if it's somebody's voice acting in something, I will pick it out. But when it's like a face or like, I, I don't know, they all kind of have this square jawline, like kind of dusty blonde brown hair, like <laughs> green eyes, maybe, like, you know, could not pick him out of a lineup. But Royce, who's the one that everyone compares you to? Is that actually Brad Pitt or is that the other one? It was the other vampire in Interview with a Vampire. Oh, Tom Cruise. Yeah. Tom Cruise. Yeah, I can see it now that you now you said like aspects of your facial features. I see with that. Yeah, for sure. But it's also like, who cares? Like, you know, like, oh, yeah, that that was the weirdest thing, because like Royce was getting those comments before that, because especially once the interview with the vampire movie came out, like Royce has the long hair. So people were like, oh, I see that now. And so people would either be like, oh, you look like Tom Cruise or you look like Lestat. I'm curious to see if that changes now that the TV show is out and we have a whole new cast of actors, but we'll see. But yeah, then I I would still occasionally from people in my life when Royce and I got married, be like, oh, lucky you, like your husband looks just like Tom Cruise. And and I'm like, I mean, lucky for me, my husband is also asexual. (laughs) Yeah, it's like there are more important things here, but like, like, thanks, I guess. Yeah. 
Like, I, I don't know. I just, I don't feel that. And that's why you, you sort of need to qualify, like, what's your definition of this? How do you experience these things? I've, I've even gotten to a place where I almost feel like I need to ask every individual person I'm having a conversation with what your definition of sex positivity is. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's probably worth it because especially like depending on where you look online, I'm sure you're going to get like 20 different definitions yeah. of what that even means. So. Yes. <laughs> and I... It's it's such a big movement and so many different things have been brought into it that depending on how you came to sex positivity, you might have a totally different idea of what that means to you than someone else. And I never want to feel like I'm being like sex positivity is bad because I, I don't think that. But I do know some people who use the word sex positivity to mean you are very open to trying different kinds of sex and you 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 seek to have you know more sexual relationships with a wider variety of people and i think that is good and you should be able to do that if that's what you want but i i don't see actively pursuing sex or different kinds of sex or more sex as a positive thing to me i i think that should still be neutral because aces kind of get left out of the conversation there if people just sort of treat sex and sex adjacent things as inherently positive because then the the unspoken side of that is like well if you don't have that that's that's kind of a bad thing maybe you should try yeah, yeah the sort of the classic like you're missing out on the most beautiful thing humans can experience like that's like i like it's the worst part for me is when i'm in a relationship with somebody who's not on the a spectrum and they almost like they want to have sex with me and they feel bad about not being able to do that and that's like a personal thing for them of like am i just not hot enough like the thing we just talked about and then also kind of almost pitying me for like not being able to fully experience this wonderful stuff uh. and i'm like <laughs> I don't know like I just feel like honestly I feel like a huge burden in my life has been lifted like I like this this whole thing that people seem to destroy their lives around uh in terms of like I met a hot guy in Greece and then I moved to Greece to be with him and then he stole my identity and all of my money like oh god like <laughs> I'm not saying that would never happen to me like ever under any circumstances but there's like certain things that I don't have to like organize my life around getting or having that other people seem to be very preoccupied about and i get to spend more time with my dog and reading books and that sounds like way more fun to me yes <laughs> but yeah i think the sex positivity thing is really interesting because I, I did a i was gonna say i did a collaboration it's not really what happened i had a small feature in an fd signifier video if you're familiar with his channel we are and we actually okay. were delighted to see you pop up on that i believe that was act after we had connected and started talking so we we had known about uh some of your content before connecting to to do this podcast because we we've had some listeners ask us questions about kink related things before and we aren't totally uneducated about kink things but we aren't a part of the kink community so we we like to have other resources we can refer people to when they want to know more and finding an ace kink educator seemed uh, perfect for that so we we'd seen a couple of your videos and then we started talking to you about doing this and then we just casually watched an FD signifier video and and saw you pop up there and we were like, oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, there I am. No, that was, uh, it was very last minute in terms of like, oh, fuck, I should probably include this angle, thing, which I'm very grateful that he did, but we didn't get the opportunity to do more of like a bigger interview. But I bring it up for the sake of the people listening who maybe haven't listened to that, which you should because it's a really good video and there was a lot of work put into it. On the sex positivity note, I feel like I don't know if it was always intended this way, but at some point, especially online, there was a shift that happened where sex positivity turned into, if you are sex positive, you will pursue lots of partners and like be proudly, openly slutty. And if yeah. you don't do that, then you're not really being sex positive yes. and you probably have some like mental hangups. And this is like a big thing as well, like polyamorous uh, and like open relationship circles that like purport to be about dating and relationships, but tend to more oftentimes be about, you know, who you can have sex with and how many people you can have sex with. And like, there's this constant tension of like, well, you don't want to slut shame people that are into this because they like having lots of sex, but then also lots of people like 
are into this for the romance part of it and everyone has to feel equally included and yada yada and with sex positivity kind of ends up being like trying to in some ways uh i think sometimes be reactively the opposite of like my christian upbringing told me to be you know faithful to one person only and marry a guy and only ever have sex with that one guy and i'm gonna do the total opposite and then if you in any way reflect that whether that be through uh, being asexual or being celibate for your own choice because you don't want to have sex because of whatever reason, like that scene is like, oh, you're just upholding patriarchal standards of yeah. sexual control over women. And it's like, no, I just don't really like care that much. <laughs> See, that that's my biggest frustration is the p- folks who do take it that way. And I, I know full well that people who identify as sex positive, like not everybody has that same association. But to say that those people aren't out there, <laughs> I think, uh, does a great injustice to a lot of the experiences that some of us do have. Because also, like, just tacked on to the, like, let's let's just tack this on to sex positivity comes, like, conversations about consent. So if you even start to question, like, hey, what really is sex positivity and does does this really align with goals for me? People are like, oh, well, that's, that's not very feminist. And don't you like consent? Don't you like sex education? It's like, I love consent and sex education. But that's not how everybody is using that. <laughs> yeah. Or, like, for me, I... I think the most common argument I have with people about this is enthusiastic consent as like a concept because as an ace person, I am capable of giving consent, but also I might not be super enthusiastic about it. So either you're saying I am incapable of consenting because I will never be enthusiastic about it. Because it it sort of started as this premise of like, ideally, the best way to obtain consent is to make sure your partner is giving you a hell yes, I want to be here, I want to do this, great, especially counter to the typical framing beforehand which is like you gotta take what you want from women and it's like oh god like maybe (laughs) we shouldn't do that but like i feel like people have taken that as is what often happens with internet terms is you get sort of this reframing of it as being about if you are not enthusiastically consenting it's not really consent and so I have, over time, proposed various other alternative terms like affirmative consent because that means you're actively like present and there and you're affirmatively saying, yes, I want this. But it's not about like the, um, the emotional framework in which you say that because it's like I could say yes and like be like, yeah, yeah, for sure, let's do this. But I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, not going to be like, hell yeah, I totally want this at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'm ever like that about anything. Yeah, I'm that's just, just not. That's not the vocabulary I use or the, the way I carry myself. Yeah, I'm a very, uh, I can be very energetic about certain things, uh, almost all of which relate to cute things and spooky things and almost nothing to do with other people. Uh, so I can be very enthusiastic about a, a cute Pomeranian dressed up like a spider, uh, but I'm not going to be, <laughs> I'm not going to be enthusiastic about like getting sushi for dinner or having sex or like what well, I can consent to it but I'm not going to be like yeah let's do it like this is not my personality at all so totally relate to that yeah and that enthusiastic consent too because that un- unfortunately has been used by very conservative people to I guess prove they think that asexuals are groomers. I don't know if you're familiar with the whole uh, girl guiding fiasco from a year ago. <laughs> Mm, no, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so last year during Ace Week 2021, Girl Guiding in the UK, which is, you know, they're Girl Scouts. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Just just made a very innocent Twitter post just like, hey, happy Ace Week. We support the aces in our organization. Just like light, light positivity and acknowledgement mm-hmm. of the week. And then we got slammed with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hate comments. There was not a single positive one. Oh, God. And and that prompted the Safe Schools Alliance UK to, to publish on their website an entire article about how asexuals are groomers and should not work with kids. And they how? were- they use Wait, what they, is the justification for that take? Oh, there were a lot of them. I, I will I will send you a link after this okay. so you, you can see the horror yourself. Um I think right. we also talked about it on our podcast about a year ago exactly when this happened too. But oh my goodness. Oh god. Was that the episode that was sort of recapping Ace Week for that year? Yeah, we just did like a Ace Week, the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
And there was ugly. There was ugly. ugly. But yeah, so Safe Schools Alliance, they, because the thing is too, and here, here's something we have talked a lot about on the podcast, because people do often say sexuality is the invisible orientation. And in many ways it is, but there actually are very conservative, usually religious right-wing organizations who are actually listening to us pretty intently, and they are spinning things in a very wrong way because they're taking for granted that the people who would theoretically be our allies if they knew the proper information probably haven't gotten it yet. So they're they're trying to beat everyone to the punch. And one, one of them was like, oh, just because someone is asexual doesn't mean that they don't have sex. You talk to any ace and they'll say that aces can have sex. And that's how they use this to groom children because they'll they'll come to a teenager oh. and they'll say like, oh, just because you don't have sexual attractions to me doesn't mean we can't have sex because maybe you're just asexual. And they'll use that to, and, and it's like, just the most warped logic you could possibly imagine. And and I hate it so much because it's it's just so blatantly untrue. And this could really affect the livelihoods of actual ace people. I mean, I I taught children for, for 15 years or so, and I love working with kids. And for, to have someone say, like, just because I'm asexual, I'm a groomer. But and th- the thing is... Issues like that don't get spotlighted in the same way uh, hatred and bigotry towards, you know, homosexuality does, to, towards trans individuals. Like, there, there is more of a media pushback and on things like that when people say, you know, gays are groomers, then there will at least be some organizations that are trying to combat that. But the issues with the aces tends to fly under the radar because people will say like, oh, well, aces aren't actually discriminated against. They don't actually face things, you know, the way gay people do. It's like, we, it's actually incredibly similar. <laughs> very, very, very similar if you are listening. So one, one thing we always try to do is like, Let's not just see someone saying these things and just shrug it off as like, oh, they're just a bigot. They don't know what they're talking about and ignore them because quietly they actually are, you know, gaining ground politically in many cases because those things don't leave their bigoted circles and people don't make a fuss about it. So that that was a big issue. And so the the conversations about any aces who may either situationally or occasionally or or even just for the aces who are on the the more favorable side of things and do enjoy uh having sex i i i felt like there's a lot lacking in the general education about how to navigate certain sexual relationships like that as an ace person because a lot of it gets boiled down to like well if you can't if you can't give your partner sex, just open the relationship and do an open relationship. And we're we're very in favor of people whom that relationship structure works for them. But sort of along the lines of like, well, if you aren't enthusiastic and actively trying to have a lot more sex, then that's almost seen in some sex positive cases as a bit of a moral failing because, well, that's pretty conservative. And if you're a woman, well, that's not very feminist. You'll sort of see the same thing with monogamy sometimes because they'll be like well if you are really sex positive then why why don't you allow the option for either you or your partner or both to have multiple partners and i think i i've kind of started conceptualizing the spectrum of monogamy to polyamory or any variations upon open relationships almost also to be a part of one's orientation i think some people are a little more you know, likely to want to go one way or another. And I, I, I've i even wondered the same thing about kink. Are some people just, is kink part of an orientation for people? I'd be curious to hear what your opinion is on that. It's interesting because I've asked people this before. I actually did a Instagram takeover for the Doing It podcast. And I asked people if they considered like, non-monogamy or polyamory to be more of an orientation thing or like a relationship style and like 90 percent of people are like it's a relationship style i think people are very understandably in a way defensive over like in the same way most communities are about their things their precious things they don't want to be tainted or, or diluted in any way they're like oh we can't call these other things an orientation because then that lessens the meaning of like 
you know, my gender identity or my sexual orientation as being what they are. And if we lump all these other things in here, like suddenly we're going to have the cishets at Pride. And like, <laughs> that's what it always goes to is like, we cannot allow the cishets to be at Pride. Like that's like the <laughs> ultimate fear. It really, it's like, so at least on Twitter, that seems to be the point people go to is like, what's going to happen next? We're going to have polyamorous, heterosexual. It's like, but almost everyone I know that does polyamory is queer. So like, whatever. <laughs> But yeah, I think if, I always try to keep in mind that the labels we use to describe orientation, be that LGBT plus or whatever else, is our best guess in the English language to try and describe a really complicated set of human experiences. And I think there's room to be more expansive with the way we talk about things, not just like, we got to add an extra letter onto the alphabet soup. What do you mean? Like, people get all upset that there's going to be a P for polyamory before there's going to be a P for pansexual. And it's like, no, nobody's asking for that, at least not seriously, I don't think. But I think there should be some room to conceptualize, like, the diversity of human interests and experiences and i i definitely know people where like they are not happy being monogamous they are very naturally polyamorous and open and they they don't conform to like the social expected pair bonding and especially even for people on the a spectrum right and arrow people right like queer platonic relationships is a way of thinking about non-monogamy and like that's totally on the list as well and when it comes to kink i also think they can definitely be considered on some sort of larger spectrum of like how humans interact with the world and what they prioritize in their interactions because i know a lot of people where the kink comes before anything else like it's not really that their kink is their sexual attraction necessarily, but they care more about that than they do kind of like, am I bi, am I pan, am I straight, am I whatever? Like, they're just like, I don't really care about any of that. Like, I like playing with people and doing this activity with people that I energetically vibe with more so than worrying about what gender I'm attracted to. So I think there has to be some kind of way eventually at some point to sort of incorporate a way of thinking about these and people hate thinking about the fact that, like, like same with ace people, like, uh, you know, are they even marginalized? Like, they do the same thing for Polly, do the same thing with kink. And, like, from my experience in the dying days of Twitter, uh, the current punching bag is, like, polyamorous people, because how dare they want anything from society in terms of acceptance? Like, unbelievable. Mm. <laughs> uh, that they would... Mm. That they, un how dare they just let people know that they exist? Which I feel like is oftentimes what happens to ace people as well. It's just, like, we say that something about ourselves or our community people go oh my god like you're not even that oppressed like what are you complaining about and it's like i feel like unless like it's really sad because i feel like the only thing that's gonna really this is morbid but i feel like the only thing that's really gonna change to make people like in a larger scale consider ace people to be like valid as like a marginalized orientation is gonna be like somebody getting killed like publicly like an incel or somebody Someone writing did. a manifesto oh. yeah and then but it has to get like mainstream news coverage right like it has to be important enough for people oh. to pay attention about it do, oh do i want to say the name so yes, a few years ago there was a teenage girl she was 17 she was asexual she had come out as asexual online I would say probably don't say the name because as of a few years I'm ago, not gonna say the name. it was still very searchable. It, it There's a Wikipedia page for this murder. Like there were photos of a nearly decapitated body that went viral. Oh my God. And this happened <sighs> just like literally three days after she was featured on the This Is What Asexuality Looks Like Instagram account. Oh. And it, she had posted on social media about being asexual. And so a lot of us were just getting to know her because she had just come out and she was using these big hashtags that the community was using to find each other at the time. And then her murder was very, very public. Like, <laughs> I, I saw the body and it was it was a horrible, horrible, devastating thing. So those of us in the community that were aware of her were were mourning and that this is what asexual looks like instagram account just did like a hey we're gonna go silent for a while to to honor her memory kind of a thing uh which was very very rightfully so but her her parents didn't think she was asexual and that that's why i don't want to say the name because of course the parents are going to grieve regardless but and i don't want to add to that trauma for any surviving family members but it was very disappointing to see that we did get attacked and in in some pretty large 
news articles too. The uh, Rolling Stone even said that, you know, asexuals are trying to push their agenda. They're trying to say like they're trying to use this poor girl's murder to to push their asexual agenda. It's like we were literally just mourning a brand new community member who came out to us in our community with our hashtags, showed her face and then was very quickly murdered very publicly by an incel, of course we're going to grieve and we're going to mourn and we're going to feel for that. But it wasn't reported as a hate crime. People either don't mention her asexuality or they completely erase it altogether. Like I said, there isn't a Wikipedia page about the murder uh, doesn't mention asexuality, but we we were there like this. This was our community. So that's part of the biggest frustration for me. Anytime people say aces aren't really oppressed, it's really just you are not listening to us when we say that we are. There have been murders. There have been hate crimes. They don't get reported as hate crimes. In, in the U.S., there's only one state that actually mentions asexuality as a protected orientation under anti-discrimination laws, and that's New York. So as much as some of the legislation is very vague, like regardless of sexual orientation, it's like, well, does the state actually recognize asexuality as an orientation? Because with things like HSDD still being in the DSM, there's a plausible argument for people to say like, well, it could just be a medical condition. It could just be a mental disorder. Oh. Everyone gets that, right? They're like, have you had your horm hormones checked? Have you had this? I'm like, yes, I have many times. It's <laughs> none of your fucking business what the results are. But that like, and it's funny because there's also like, there's studies that show that like ACE people and people that have like HSDD and like have like clinical distress from like hypo, like sexual desire disorder, I think is what it's called. Yeah. Like they actually, like the, like the way we think about sex and desire and everything is very different between those two groups. Because it turns out that, like, most ace people outside of social pressure are not really distressed about lack of sexual attraction or, you know, lack of having a certain type of fantasy life or whatever. But yeah, that's just so, like, it just really goes to show, like, how what you said earlier about, like, it being almost an invisible orientation is so true. Because, yeah, if you deny that the orientation exists, you deny the person has that orientation, and you don't report on it, it's magically not a hate crime, and I guess ace people aren't really oppressed conveniently you get to make that point even though it's not actually true like i didn't even know about that which is horrible and you know it's um there do you want to talk about the uh recent youtuber situation where somebody did like a little podcast format where they talked about asexuality oh, at all or we we did do a twitter post about that uh yeah let's let's get into it because for for the most part so before we get into it i do want to acknowledge that we don't have an issue with most of the video. I love when aces can sit down and talk about their own experiences. And when it is from my own experience, like every experience is correct, whether it's ex favorable, neutral, kinky, not kinky, monogamous, polyamorous, like all of these are beautiful things to celebrate within the community. There was a video posted by James Summerton, who is someone we we have donated uh, quite a lot of money to to set up the um, he founded uh, Telos Pictures, a, a movie media production company. And at the time that was announced, it was uh, meant to be a very like it just queer movies, like let's get more queer representation out there. And and we've liked some of his YouTube videos talking about different types of representation. And we we often agree with things he says. So we thought, well, yes, if someone's going to actively try to get more representation out there, someone who we we trust based on other videos, we definitely want to donate to that. So we'd actually emailed him at the time asking if there was going to be um, a sexual representation on the table at all. Because, of, of course, aces have been burned before. Like, queer representation doesn't always necessarily include us. But but he said, yes, absolutely. He said, they're, they're, we're, we're going to have aces on the writing team even. And I was like, done, take our money. Absolutely. Because we want more representation. And, and we do that a lot. Anytime someone's like, here's a project I'm trying to fundraise for ace stuff. It's like, let's get more of that out in the world. <laughs> we'll <laughs> yeah. give you the money if we have it. So yeah, the, the recent video, it was just like a few minutes and we were watching and we were like, oh, no. 
just because yeah. uh, it, I'm sure we had the same reaction at the same time because I, I started watching it like literally 10 minutes after it went live like I was like oh boy I'm so excited it's so awesome I love James let's see what he has to say and I went oh I gotta switch to my other account I gotta leave a comment <laughs> like yeah oh so you actually commented on that video yeah then. <laughs> I don't think I like I've, I've looked for my own comment before and as far as I can tell James does not really interact too much with YouTube comments so I don't know if he saw it or not but I did leave a comment that a lot of people responded to and it got a fair amount of engagement of like, hey, I just want to gently push back on the notion that ace people don't experience conversion therapy. Here's some points about why that's not really true. It doesn't really look the same as like gay conversion therapy does, but there's definitely preceding elements to that that are coalescing and threatening to become more of a concrete, this is how we fix the ace people. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because yeah, the, the two comments that we took issue with, and I, I was so glad that after these comments were out of the way, because we, we were still pressing on, we were watching the whole thing. And we did watch the whole thing before we tweeted about it. But we did think that there was some information that was just very incorrect. And, and should have been set straight. But the co-host of that podcast, Nick, is ace. And uh, they they did specify at one point, like, I am asexual and here's here's my experience in it. But that wasn't stated for like, I don't know, 10 minutes into yeah. the video or something. So for- it took a while where I was like, wait, I think he's talking about we, not not just like these people over here. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. the first couple comments that just sent off our alarm bells was... Aces don't face discrimination in the same way gay people do, which there's a very big debate to be made there. And also that aces don't experience conversion therapy, which because we, uh, we've we seen the studies from Stonewall that say that aces face conversion therapy at 10% as opposed to 7% for the entire queer community. So we are actually more likely to experience conversion therapy than than the the gay community. And I think we are only beaten by uh, trans conversion therapy at 13 percent, which makes a lot of sense, especially in <laughs> in the UK with their little turf problem. Yeah, right little turf <laughs> islands. Always got to be doing the worst, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Yeah. The, so. uh, yeah, that was I, I think, it, you know something to be said for like making sure you stayed up front like hey this thing we're talking maybe it just seems obvious when you're in the moment you're talking to a friend and it's like yeah i know that he's ace and uh, like uh, you don't think to even really make it a prominent thing before you start talking about it but i think even members of our community especially if you are more used to like being in gay men spaces uh, you're seeing that perspective maybe more than the ace perspective and you might not fully realize like what the extent of reality is because it's so erased and not talked about that like yeah if you don't ever see the house is on fire you don't ever realize that there's houses on fire and it's you know you got to have somebody point it out to you for you to realize hey actually there's a lot of houses on fire it's not that homes never catch on fire and there is something to be said for the difference in personal experience yes men are often less likely to need to tell their doctor that they're asexual in the first place. Mm -hmm. You don't have to deal with the potential of getting pregnancy tests or things like that. Yeah, I have faced quite a lot of m medical <laughs> issues. And, and, and I do know, too, and I think most aces who were at least on social media around the time that, oh, I'm, I can't think of the exact drug name, but it was being peddled as like female Viagra at one yeah. point. Which, I left that in my comment. It was like, oh, you remember this? Oh, gosh. I, I joined some asexual Facebook groups when I joined Facebook. And I was like, immediately after I clicked away from that group, within within minutes of joining it, it was like, here is libido medication for women just targeted at, at me every single day. And it's like, <sighs> And so, yeah, it's it's kind of also, you know, what is conversion therapy? And I do think that even gay men who have not experienced conversion therapy firsthand themselves uh, sometimes, and, and I'm not saying that this is the specifically James or Nick, I'm just talking broadly speaking, a lot of people don't tend to really even know what conversion therapy looks like or what the full scope of it can be. Because I think, well, especially, especially straight people uh, just think of it as like the Christian camps you get sent to, yep. which is very much an issue. Do not get me wrong. But 
There is also medical conversion therapy, and there are things like corrective sexual assault that do get statistically lumped in with types of conversion therapy as well. So so there are a lot of different forms conversion therapy can take, and depending on what the orientation is and what form it's taking, it might not get as much widespread discussion as some of the other ones. So yeah, that that was all, and and we're really really hopeful that there will be more discussions of asexuality in the future, and especially a, an account like that. I mean, James's following is huge. We just we we get so many people saying like, well, aces don't face conversion therapy, so they're not oppressed, and it's like, ah, uh, I I don't want anything to reinforce that because we we have seen the studies. <laughs> And and sort of sort of even the notion about just Christianity, because people will say like, oh, well, they're they're all puritanical and anti-sex. But we we did a very, very long in-depth uh, four-part series back in August about the uh, discrimination that we do get from the uh, religious right wing of this country in the U.S. specifically we were talking about. But it's there. It's a lot more similar to other forms of homophobia, queerphobia, transphobia than a lot of people give it credit for. Yeah. Well, and also at the same time, like, let's just say, for the sake of having an argument, that ace people don't experience conversion therapy. That does not make ace people less queer. And it's not like queerness is not dictated by like people oppressing you or like trying to physically harm you. That's like a very, to me at least, that's kind of like a downer way of conceptualizing that the queer community is like, oh, we're queer because mainstream society wants to cause us harm and get rid of us. I'm like, well, that's not uh, what this is about, I I hope, anyways. But at the same time, like, again, there's that ignorance of knowing if it even actually happens or not. And certainly there's a lot of people that, you know, get talked into it by a dissatisfied partner or they have doctors who medicalize their, like, reasonable experience of their orientation and, and just decide that, like, well, you need to be fixed. So here we're going to give you the stuff. We're going to get rid of the problem you have of... Not being sexually attracted to anyone, because that's for some reason a very big problem to a lot of people. But yeah, it's uh, not a competition to see who the most oppressed is, and only the most oppressed are allowed to be in the club, because that is ridiculous. Oh yeah, absolutely, because for as flawed as that logic is in general, just as, as a concept, it's wrong. It also doesn't really address the facts that there are certain, you know, discriminations and persecutions that just get ignored. <laughs> They just get ignored. I, I saw someone make an argument the other day that, oh, well, aces don't face marriage discrimination like gay people do. And that uh, whew, that was really weird to hear because currently, at least in the U.S., I don't know where that person is, asexual or platonic or queer platonic marriages have fewer legal protections than than gay marriage. And that was that was a big uh, part of our series going into the like religious and political discrimination because we we are married. We've been married eight and a half years now. We were literally searching for states that we could legally get married in that don't have consummation laws on the books. And of course, this this was before Obergefell versus Hodges anyway. So, you know, a, a gay keep a gay couple in our position would have been doing the same thing. Like, well, what state can I legally get married? in. So, so yeah, we, we decided to get married in Kansas because it was perfectly A-OK -okay here. But back in July, there was a letter written to Mitch McConnell by 83, signed by 83 uh, religious organizations that were condemning the Respect for Marriage Act, which thankfully that just got voted on. It did pass. So that's our that's our happy update. Our negative uh, update is we told you Mitch McConnell voted no. We told you back in <laughs> July that that was going to happen, um, along with some other Republicans. But they were specifically condemning the act and they mentioned platonic marriages because they said, oh, well, platonic marriage is going to be a startling expansion of what marriage means. And of course, they were lumping it in with like, oh, what's next? Platonic marriage and also marriage amongst family members. So it's like, yeah, platonic marriage is totally exactly the same thing as incest. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Wasn't it at one point called the bottom of the slippery slope? Yes. Yeah. We, oh we, my God. we pulled an article that called- Nothing is worse than marrying your friends. Everyone knows that the only way you should have marriage is when you hate your spouse, according to straight Twitter. Yeah, it, absolutely. It, it, it's wild because we, we have found so many articles condemning platonic marriage, queer platonic marriage, asexual marriage, asexual people in general. But they they just don't get the noise. People don't see it, and they don't they don't care, and they don't amplify it. They don't condemn it. So the, these things just sort of fly under the radar for years until platonic marriage is getting condemned as a reason why we shouldn't have the Respect for Marriage Act. But they're they're actually two like legally speaking legal uh, I guess mindsets in this country right now. I mean, especially with. Uh, the Supreme Court the way it is, like a, a conservative versus a liberal justice, they have very different ideas of how they read the law. That that actually is happening right now with, you know, use whatever word you want, queer platonic, asexual platonic marriage. There are conservative judges who do not think that that is currently, nor should it be, a legal form of marriage. And we've seen them document why and how they think that sex is inherent to marriage and that it is one and the same. You cannot separate them. You cannot have a marriage without sex. And it's like- Sounds like a good way to overturn spousal rape laws as well. Exactly. Because that's a thing that needs to be done. I exactly. say sarcastically and in a horrified manner. Yes, like exactly. So there, there are so many other issues. Like when, yes, when I do talk about like, the, these are asexual issues and these are issues we're facing right now that aren't getting the attention. It's like, it's not- just about us either like there there are so many other people that this can affect and go wrong for if these positions are allowed to progress anymore and that's why we need to be listening to what they're saying and actually take their word for it and take this as a serious you know political attack in in many cases so yeah there was a lot of people that were making noise about like marriage between a man and a woman is about reproduction so i don't know if they're necessarily going off of that or, or if it's just they're sort of all coalescing around the same idea but certainly there is a lot of uh, groundswell amongst members of the far right and you know people and the republicans in this country and so on that are all thinking along the same lines as like well marriage is about having sex and having children which is like a whole other can of worms of like you know, okay, what about people who can't have children or can't afford it or whatever? Like, and I hope, but at the same time, I also know ace people that have kids and like, you know, so it's, it's just such a mess. And like, yeah, I just don't think things really get the attention they deserve for the legal discrimination aspect of it gets like, oh, what's the big deal? Like, as far as I'm concerned, I very much have the mentality of like, if they come from one of us, they're coming for all of us. Yeah. Like, whether that be trans issues gay issues, asexual issues, like they all overlap so much. And like for, you know, to bring it back to kink a little bit, like there's a lot of overlap in the assaults against trans rights and kink and conflating it and sort of the like being trans is kinky and kids being around anything vaguely kinky is the worst thing humanly possible and it's grooming and yada, yada, yada. And very much connecting these ideas. And I think it, gets to a point where like not only are they attacking trans people which is horrible and awful but then also that gets tied to kink for any person of any kind no matter your orientation no matter if you're married or not it's considered abhorrent and deviant and must be regulated out of existence uh and and bdsm as it is has a very tenuous uh legal standing in the u.s depending on what state you're in and there are a lot of people who go through divorce court and have their private interest in BDSM dragged through the courts as a reason for why they shouldn't have children because oh. having a, a private interest in BDSM means that you can't be like there's so many things that they go this means you can't be trusted around children if you're polyamorous if you're kinky if you're asexual if you're trans if you're gay if you're anything other than a straight man who owns a like is a pastor and owns a church it's the only reason you're the only people who are safe to be around kids and it's like I'm getting a sense that restricting the safe people for kids is a really like a like a tool for controlling children to make sure they can't you know leave the narrow lives they are allowed to live in those spaces and actually be around safe people who could maybe tell them how to uh, and it's like it's sad because there's a lot of kids that um get kind of i don't know there was a story on twitter of somebody that um maybe it was on reddit first originally there was somebody who uh their kid ended up basically being convinced 
by an adult stranger who knew them online that like their friend was actually their friend who was another teenager who was like 15 or something was they were the groomer because they were drawing anime art and like Ugh. oh my god just like the extent these people will go to to call everyone else but themselves a groomer is uh i don't know why that's become the hot new thing of the 2020s but that's what we're doing with this decade i suppose yeah well and i find that behind every discrimination no matter what sort of measured argument you can put towards it there's always another lesser discussed community that you can use to throw under the bus to progress the bigoted agenda so like yep. trans issues for example like they are definitively trans issues like we need to respect people's f fucking gender mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know people will say like well you know trans rights or fighting for trans rights they'll they'll people will try to skirt it in all of these wild ways like oh well this person isn't trans you know <laughs> dressing as a woman is just their kink it's like okay well now you're implying there's something inherently wrong with kink because your first argument that we shouldn't respect this person's gender didn't work, so you move down the line to try to progress the same bigoted agenda. Uh, asexuality, we've also seen get brought up in the name of fighting against trans issues, which is just so repulsive on every level, because of course they're also ace trans folks. But there, there was a Texas congressional candidate, thank goodness he didn't actually get elected, but uh, he had a trans child and <laughs> lost custody of them. And he was basically running on like anti-trans issues almost exclusively. But his logic for why it's wrong to, you know, give trans children the medical care they need was all came down to compulsory sexuality. He was like, oh, my child is never going to have a normal, healthy, functioning sex life with with a spouse. And it's like, that's your issue? That, <laughs> like, that's your issue? Like, it sounds like you'd still be upset if, if that child was ace because you are looking at all of this from a point of sex and procreation. And that's a lot of the conservative mindset. So... To say that Christians actually like ace people because they're more pure is very, very incorrect. <laughs> no, they do not. Yeah, not in my personal experience. They either assume we're secretly in the closet as gay or lesbian and we just, you know, we need to be fixed in that direction. Or they're like, why aren't you doing your godly, wifely duties of reproducing for your husband you don't have yet, but you definitely have? And it's like... Yeah. I don't exist as like a birth vessel. I don't like, that's not, uh, yeah, no, they are not a fan of, uh, and there was, uh, there's been some talk about this on Twitter recently, which has been nice as people are more recognizing, I think that like, no, they're not our friends either. They, they don't support us. They don't like us because we represent yet another different variation of how to exist on a human being. That's not their very narrow way of being a human. And they are going to do what they need to do to quash that with whatever justification necessary yeah no absolutely because we we also um when we did our series deep 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 dive into the religious political discrimination in this country we did have some some christians crawling out of the woodwork to uh yell at us and they like the things they were saying to us like we got called insults to humanity and nature and i i love that i put it in our twitter bio for a while i was like yes Asexual podcast hosted by insults to humanity and nature, Courtney and Rice. <laughs> like, I like that part was funny, but we had people being like, We don't hate asexuals. We just think that your life is twisted and backwards and <laughs> and that you're insults to humanity and nature. And it's like, yeah, it sounds a lot like hate to me. <laughs> but it, it's also just sort of the um it, it, I guess it kind of goes both ways too, because people will use other also marginalized but less discussed and less fought for communities to to push their bigotry in one way or another. People also kind of need to use other accepted communities to sort of latch on to in order to try to fight for more rights. And I mean, do what you got to do in the moment. But sometimes that does lead to some additional issues because Obergefell versus Hodges, like, you know, same sex marriage law of the land now and all that. But the way that that got passed was because it was argued in court 
that a same-sex marriage is still going to function the same way an opposite-sex marriage, which has the implication of sex and even children, because they, it was even argued in court, you know, a same-sex couple should be able to adopt a child to function like a straight couple, essentially, which is just not how that any of that works. But that that's actually put some road roadblocks in place towards the protections for asexual queer platonic marriages and whatnot, but also for any polyamorous marriage rights, because if it's this has to function as a couple, as two people, that's set a precedence that's going to make it even harder for these other lesser discussed communities in the political landscape. Yeah. Yeah, I think especially with the polyamorous aspect of it, there's a lot of like issues that are kind of like on the one hand like you said like do what you got to do and i'm glad that we ended up you know arguing that in court and everything went the way that it did because otherwise it would have been very like it would have been a much longer road to get where we ended up i think without having that but yeah it kind of does end up with a scenario where unless it's like individual states doing something legislatively it becomes very difficult to use that framework for queer platonic marriages or, you know, polyamorous relationships. Because, I mean, that is also, like, yet again, the slippery slip are like, why are you, we're gonna legalize polygamy? What's next? Marrying <laughs> cows? And it's like, can cows consent? No. <laughs> like, there's an easy answer. Uh, no, they're not the same because animals are animals that cannot give consent and people are different, turns out, sometimes. I know some of y'all think women and cows are the same, but they're actually not, weirdly. Uh, so... I am. Um, yeah, it's it'd be interesting to see what ends up kind of happening in the next couple of years. I feel like we could either really go down this pathway of paving the way for even more progressive things getting enacted and maybe there being more room for things like polyamorous marriages or or solidifying that like no you don't have to have kids or have sex in order to have a valid marriage or we go in the opposite direction everything kind of spirals out of control and you know it, it does not end up going very well and i choose to think more about the uh the, or at least invest more of my emotional energy into thinking about that not happening than it actually happening yeah um, we can dream but it's hard <laughs> <laughs> we can dream. Yes, we can definitely dream. But yeah, with with the polyamory thing too cuz that that's also another thing I've heard people, you know, demonize kink over like, oh, well, polyamory is just a kink. <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious. Yeah. Which is again the imp the implication is that kink is bad, but yeah, there there was a there was a court case in New York recently that went favorably that did establish a light level of protection for a a polyamorous uh, situation with a a housing dispute that was happening. So that yes. that was encouraging to see. But although we haven't had any sort of ace or platonic court cases in the U.S. that I'm aware of, there was a recent one in Sweden um, mm. where there were two women who were living together. And I, I actually, I, I've engaged with Swedish culture, but I've been learning Swedish for some of my work-related reasons for the last few years for some research. But Sweden doesn't have quite the like mandatory marriage culture that we have here. <laughs> which a lot of it comes from, you know, Christianity and conservatism. But in Sweden, it's a lot more normal to be like long term live in partners without formally getting married than it is here. And their their word for that is sambo. But there was sort of a court case where um, a woman uh, passed away. And so her, her sambo was trying to get, you know, rights to, you know, housing as a state kind of a thing. And the reason why this was being argued was they were kind of saying like, well, is this actually a Sambo situation? Because everyone was saying, as far as we know, this relationship wasn't actually sexual. So they were like, well, are they actually like live in life partners or were they just, you know, just friends, more casual yeah. roommates, just friends? And and that actually did go in her favor. So that that did pass. And that was a wonderful precedence uh, for, for Sweden. Of course, we don't have one like that yet. But that that's just another example of how if you assume that sex is required for any of these legal protections, that can really open the door to some issues. That's so true. One thing that occurred to me 
on our last topic and earlier in the episode was that when talking about things like orientation and uh, relationship structure, like monogamy versus polyamory, or just a minute ago, Courtney, you mentioned kink, it kind of seems like people are leaning very heavily on connotation for established words. Yeah. Like for the word orientation, we have already jumped over the hurdle that orientation is not a choice. And so for things like your relationship structure, that may be something that you are just hardwired into or for things like kink that can just be a part of how you have engaged in relationships forever, it may be tempting to take those and attach them to a word that has already been proven to not be a choice instead of go through all of the effort to change social connotation. Yeah. And and in, re- in reverse, taking something like polyamory and calling it a kink, well, I think that most people see kink activities as like a hobby. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that you, you have learned to go and, and do and enjoy and not a part of who you are. Yeah, I think that's very true. Like, it's it's difficult to, I don't know, resist the urge to, like, be like, look, we're valid because we're also, like, this other thing that's valid and not do the work to kind of carve out a, a space for, especially if you are one of those people for whom, like, you being poly does not feel like a choice. It does not feel like you you do you have tried monogamy and has failed. It does not work for you. This is what or people do the same thing with kink, right? Where they just are deeply unhappy with vanilla relationships or vanilla sex, and they're like, I don't know how else to describe this other than this orientation label. Even if for other people it is more of a choice, they could take it or leave it. They're happy doing one or the other, or it's something they like learn to do at, over time, but are maybe not like drawn to and like an inherent level where you know they couldn't do anything else except for that i think that's also something that happens to either other people that are queer other people that are part of the lgbt plus community like you almost have to tell this whole story about like well i always knew i was really a girl because when i was three i tried on my mom's high heels and like you end up having to like kind of turn your whole life into the story about like how my identity is actually valid and and how it's actually you know the way I just am and the please don't hate me <laughs> like it's like people are not allowed to evolve or change over time they must always be what they have always been and if you in any way insinuate that something is a choice that somehow makes it less valid which is uh confusing oh exactly and i mean i and especially in cases where like the the trans you know gender clinics where you need to go through the the questionnaire in order to get your medication like a lot of trans folks i've spoken to have said like yeah i really felt like i needed to not necessarily lie but at least over exaggerate and over emphasize like this has always been an inherent part of me that i've known without a shadow of a doubt no questioning whatsoever no actual like natural organic process of exploration and i mean it, that that is just sort of the way people see things like even even love is love like that was something that i i said myself around the time of obergefell versus hodges and prior like love is love but you know, being in the ace community, I've learned that even in other corners of of queer culture, people still assume that love means sex or that love means romance. And if your type of love doesn't sort of line up with their vision of it, then it, it doesn't get the same level of uh, championing. Yeah. Or even just like caring about love at all, right? Because you can be aromantic and just be like, well... I still have these very deep, important connections, uh, but they, they're they not based on a conception of love or romance, because what the fuck does that even mean in the first place, right? Like, right. <laughs> love isn't even something that we really understood as a species until relatively recently, so why are we treating this as this, like, marker of, of true validity, is this concept of, of love, and that's sort of the argument that people have about, you know, uh, assimilation versus kind of being a different, separate way of of having a community or having a culture is you know like why are we trying to stick ourselves in these boxes of of acceptability and and trying actively to we're just like we're just like everyone else we're just like the straights we do this that and the other and we fall in love and we want to have kids and a white picket fence and capitalism and yay and it's like uh maybe we don't all have to be that way yeah maybe not (laughs) well evie while we have you I'm very curious to get your opinion on this specific thing because it's one that mm. we've we've in our house talked about a lot, mostly in terms of like what we've seen from the discourse. And I know 
can get pride is a whole can of worms. So mm, we we do much. we do not necessarily need to get into the whole history of it because we we've covered bits and pieces of the history in past episodes. But this year and the last couple of years, there have been sort of a common refrain we've seen people say on social media that say like, well, you know, kink at pride is just, you know, someone wearing a thong and no one's actually breaking out the St. Andrew's cross at pride. And I've I've seen that said over and over and over again. But at our pride event, like five years ago, there, w- there was a St. Andrew's cross, like right next to the henna tattoos in the shopping section where people are like buying t-shirts and buttons and things. And we were like, everybody we see in the discourse is saying, nobody is doing this at Pride, but we did see that. And I'm curious what your opinions are of that. Did did our Pride mess up? Should our Pride have not done that? <laughs> I mean, I, it just there's so many Does different... that happen at more Prides that we don't know about? I'm sure it, I'm sure it has, but I think also like I think people want to conceptualize pride as being this like single unified thing where all prides are the same and they're ran by the same people and they all have these same universal values and they really don't. Like you are going to see prides that are like family friendly, animal balloons and face painting and like the whole pride is very like centered around the like, you know, gay family unit of like the lesbians that have like two kids and like, you know, like it's very family centric, right? And you have other pride events that are like break out the glitter thong and the St. Andrew's cross and the, you know, and the leathers and everything else. And I, I think for me, that whole argument is like, I think the main thing is, is like, if it is in the terms of the event, this thing is allowed, that this thing will be here and be part of it. You can't really punish the people for following the rules, right? It's one thing if somebody goes against the rules and they're doing something where they're running uh, the, the example everyone uses is the gimp suit right there's somebody running around in a gimp suit at pride and it's like first of all kids aren't really gonna know what that means and there's gimp suit jokes in kids media like spongebob already so yeah. like i don't i don't know what to what to say about that exactly but you know people are like oh my god there's somebody in a gimp suit running around my family friendly pride event and it's like well i don't think that exactly is happening but i think there should be kink spaces where everyone gets to feel welcome right we have the kids pride we have the more adult centered pride or the more sex focused pride because like i haven't been to a lot of pride events but i feel like sexuality tends to be very forefront regardless like at the pride in seattle there's like people doing all kinds of pole dancing and there's people doing like all kinds of stuff that's like not kink related but is very much sexual and people don't ever talk about that being an issue for family friendly pride unless there may be an outside christian organization that's like look at the deviant gays and all of their their hedonism they're exposing the children to uh but if it's somebody else that's queer is taking an issue with something it's not with the you know all the all the men in you know booty shorts and jock straps or the pole dancing or topless women with their boobs out like none of that's ever the problem it's specifically kink and i'm like well i don't know like if we're if we're using kink as a place to regulate because people think of bdsm as being inherently sexual if we're using pride as a way to regulate somebody's expression of their sexual orientation like why are we doing with this thing and not this like other other thing so i mean it would depend like was you know was it a family event where there were like kids wandering around in front of the saint andrew's cross or was it yeah (laughs) Mm, interesting this was kind of where we landed on when we were talking about this was expectations need to be set better yes hey if you're gonna have like public flogging give us a heads up first but that was about it and it was just uh like a leather stand that had the saint andrew's cross and occasionally someone would come up and fully clothed would just like okay hook me up (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> let's give it a whirl get into position and there'd be a bit of flogging and it would attract a crowd and you know people were watching and taking pictures and things like that but it, it was in the shopping tent like like no like, visibility yeah, that's, that's where people were getting it, it their was, pride um, flags their merchandise so there there was like face painting happening right there <laughs> This was a Pride event where there were two distinct times. There was a family-friendly hours, and then, like, after, you know, sunset, then it was adults only, Mm. where you're going to get carded at entry. And this was during the day, during the family section. Interesting. Yeah, and so we we were like, that's a little weird, no? 
I mean, it is because that's like I I could not say that I've ever seen or heard of anything like that before. I totally believe that it happens. That sounds to me like it's an organizer flub that like they should have done a better job of either checking out what that booth was going to be about before they gave them a daytime spot or things need to be set up. You need to know what it is you're going to be walking into and the sorts of things that you might see when you're there. I don't have any problem with like giving people a heads up of like, especially because it wasn't like, I don't know, flogging people over clothing does not sound like the most risque thing that could possibly happen at a Pride event. So no. I can't get like too mad at it, but I could see how at the very least that would be a bad optics scenario where it's like somebody takes a photo of that and goes, look, there are, they are, their deviancy is right there in front of the children. And like, I don't want to in any way poke at that or, or like give them more reason to, you know, I don't know, just anything, anything that results in something going viral on the internet amongst the far right is being proof of like the deviancy of the left or or queer people or whatever i'm like eh, like i don't know if i really want to cause more of that and cause like you know people to have to be fearful at pride parades of you know some kind of i don't know outside group coming in to be like we're here to make sure that the gays aren't exposing the children to inappropriate things and right you know oh god i just don't want that to happen oh absolutely yeah that that's kind of where we've landed on all of it just because what what we have seen and what we've experienced is just not even necessarily what's reflected in the pride at kink discourse because we we do see people saying like no one's breaking out the saint andrews cross it's like that's a very specific example that we did very specifically see and it's it's just setting expectations because we also like went onto the website and it's like a lot of kink or, or a lot of uh, uh, pride websites don't really mention kink at all. Like, is this kink friendly? And well, what does kink friendly even mean? <laughs> friendly, like it, it, it's also vague, you know. And when people say family friendly, I've had the same criticism with family friendly. Like, what is family friendly? What does that mean? Who's who's setting that metric? Exactly. Whose family are you talking about? Yeah, because like, because <laughs> like a Leatherman's family, where they're like second generation kinksters, like that might just be like a totally average thing to see in public, and they're not going to be phased by it. And I think a lot of the discourse kind of comes down to like how much. Because, like, that got the, all of that got so wild where it got to be like, if you knowingly wear sandals in public around somebody with a foot fetish, you're like doing kink in public, and that's inappropriate to do around children. And it's like, okay, note to self, I can't, like, okay, then women can't wear low cup tops because, like, they know that men are gonna look at, like, uh, like, at what point do you stop with that logic? It just got really off the rails. And um, the examples I saw were not necessarily a St. Andrew's cross, but it was stuff like, you know, like having sex in public or, or doing things like that, that people sort of associate as being like kinky acts. And I think that pride organizations could do generally a better job of telling people what to expect at their events and the sort of things you might see. Because, you know, I, I do want places to feel safe. But this is my problem with that discourse is it became about we got to protect the asexuals from seeing the kinky things. We got to protect the children and the asexuals. And it's like, first of fucking all, I have almost never felt welcome at any queer organization unless it was specifically ran by somebody who is ace. <laughs> and like, why are we only ever brought up in comparison to like children and infantilizing us and our ability to like process certain things because we're not a monolith about oh that. yeah like you're you're not coming to bat for us on our conversion therapy yeah. you're not coming to bat for us for platonic marriages you're not coming to bat for us when you know we get hate crimed and it doesn't get reported as such like that is very much like odd when you decide to become an ally to the aces <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, only when it's convenient to keep other people from doing their stuff at your event. You go, wait, what about this other group that we definitely always make sure to include and we definitely want to feel uh, welcomed? But I will say on that note of like the intersection between kink and asexuality, I I do feel like the history of pride events and kink are very much like interwoven in a lot of ways, like in terms of, and we don't have to get into the whole history of it, but I do think that there has kind of been this more recent sanitization of pride events to make them more family friendly and make them more accessible for the general public who just wants to go to a fun parade in the summer and that is not necessarily reflective of the original intent of pride or the original groups of people that were supporting it and part of it and sort of like 
should we keep sanitizing it to make people feel comfortable or is it like hey i'm here i'm queer fuck you like we're gonna do this stuff and i think there's sort of a middle ground in between those two points where it's like we don't have to make people purposely uncomfortable and and put people in the dark about what they're gonna expect to be there but we also don't have to like bend over backwards to make sure every random straight people that wants to go oogle at the men in short shorts like like they get to feel comfortable too like there's there's a middle ground between all of that and i think we're sort of you know every year this like i have a, i don't have it near me i have a book that was published in like the 80s that is talking about kink at pride and this has been an <laughs> ongoing conversation for over 30 years yep. of whether or not certain organizations should be allowed at pride whether or not certain activities have been allowed at pride and i feel like if we have if we got through the aids crisis and we didn't come up with a fucking answer to that question we're probably not gonna like <laughs> no we're, we're just gonna keep question. talking about this we're in just circles. gonna keep complaining <laughs> no matter what happens somebody's gonna complain about it but it's true yeah i will say for um ace inc inclusivity and awareness I really feel like the kink community has been the place that I have felt the most welcomed in and the most accepted in. Like there was recently, I was at a convention and one of the speeches that was given during the event, there was somebody who was talking about another event that they're hosting. It's going to be in Texas. And I went to their website afterwards to check it out because I've never traveled to Texas for a BDSM event. Maybe I want to check it out. And I saw on their diversity and inclusivity statement, they specifically called out that they asexual people. And I've never seen that. Like, before, like I'm sure I've seen it like individual people talking but like an organization saying no. in their diversity and inclusion statement that they like it's not just about you know straight people lesbians gay men you know trans people but also you know pan bisexual gender queer asexual people like That's we were amazing. all amazing that is amazing especially i mean well at, at, at any event but at a kink event i i have had conversations with other aces who are like you know i'm i'm a little curious about kink i, I want to explore it a little bit it, but also just the very fear that it will be a very, you know, sex and sexuality focused area and wondering, like, will I be able to find a place there? And will I feel comfortable here? And will people accept me here is is a very, you know, valid fear because aces are very often gate kept out of a lot of places. Yeah. And it's, it's something you have to be very attentive to. Like I always tell people, regardless of who they are, what their concerns are, like read the event rules, like if they have photos of previous events like go check those out message the event organizers because where i live now in portland like almost all of the spaces that are public that you can easily find online for bdsm events they're all swingers spaces or they're owned by swingers and so they have that particular culture to them where even if it's not like about sex like there was one kind of near to me that i've been to a few times before where it's primarily a bar and that's how they make money and Unlike in Seattle, where there's lots of rules that prevent that kind of thing from happening. And I don't really believe in mixing, you know, intoxicating substances, a public event and BDSM altogether. It's kind of a leads to consent issues, I think, more often than not. But that's my own opinion there. And they played uh, like pornography the whole time. They had like multiple. They had like four or five. Uh, screens that were playing pornography so given it was like kind of weird like i'm gonna say anime porn but i literally mean like anime characters like it was like dungeon it was like uh like dragon ball z and like it was it, I, and i understand kind of why they did it a little bit but like like it was so weird like it made me uncomfortable because like ev if i wanted to look at something that wasn't another person's face like the only alternative i had was this like bizarre anime pornography and like even if people aren't having sex there the energy is still very sex focused so in any case i tell people to really check out the events they're going to but i've been to other ones where like there's no sex there are people that you know, maybe onesies and twosies where you'll see people that are having sex or, or doing something obviously sexual. But um, there are other events, like, for example, munches, which are like social meetups at usually a bar, restaurant, coffee shop, where you just go and talk. And it's not about sex, not about you don't get naked or anything. It's just like you go... And oftentimes there's such a huge overlap in nerd culture in BDSM spaces that usually end up talking about like, hey, what's that thing on your t-shirt from? And then you get in a conversation about, you know, the Witcher Netflix series or, you know, whatever video game is coming out. And you can really relate to people outside of just talking about sex and kink. But right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of inclusivity in in kink spaces I've seen. Like there's lots of people that regularly teach classes on like demystifying asexuality in BDSM spaces. And I think there's just more and more 
representation from education from leadership and from genuinely like wanting people to feel inclusive like honestly the most inclusivity work i've seen has not been in the lgbt community it's been in the kink community like in terms of like for example we have conventions and 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 um conferences where you have a, like a usually a long weekend like three days where you have education during the daytime and like social events and then in the evening you have like a big party and now there are conventions where they have like a whole track of classes that are focused on like diversity inclusion and like BIPOC spaces or like a, a they have a dungeon set up where there's like a big main dungeon and then there's a, a space for women and a space for men and a space for trans and queer people and then also a space for BIPOC people like there's a lot of work that's being done to like and scholarship funds as well so if you are in need or if you're in certain groups of people like you can access those spaces more easily I think that's like way more than I've seen a lot of for example pride organizations do it's you know oh very much so yeah i don't hear about we're not getting bought like out by a much. gillette or whatever <laughs> that's fantastic advertisers haven't found kink as a meaningful investment yet mm-hmm. yeah no the most we get is like adam and eve sponsorships on youtube videos that's uh... really that's really <laughs> yeah i mean i'm not even sure they would really go for that demographic for advertising but like I, I feel like there's sort of this like almost anarchist anarchist streak in a lot of BDSM spaces where like yes there is like an organization but almost all of them are at least where I live in my experience they tend to be nonprofits and they tend to be like they will advertise each other in each other's spaces but they don't they are not interested in mainstream advertisers they don't really want that they just want to be able to do their thing and again not be beholden to the apples and the gillettes and the microsofts of the world uh and and having to appease their standards for what they want to see at an event i think that's uh really wonderful absolutely That's so wonderful to hear. Well, this was absolutely a pleasure. This was a wonderful conversation. Do you have any any last thoughts you want to get out before we wrap up here? Um, the only thing I think I would say is if you're listening to this and you're an ace person and you think that you might be interested in kink, I would definitely check it out. Maybe don't make a FetLife account immediately (laughs) because of the affirmation (laughs) reasons we talked about. Uh, but definitely like there is a space for you here. Like there used to be meetups where I used to live before I moved to Portland, where we would have like an ACE discussion group and an ACE meetup for kinky ACE people. So there's very much room for you. You are allowed to be here. There's a lot of us out there. So don't feel like you're alone because you're definitely not. And where can all of our lovely listeners find you around the internet and more of your content? Yeah, so I am Evie Lupine, E-V-I-E-L-U-P-I-N-E, pretty much everywhere. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Twitter for as long as the servers keep running. If it still exists by the time this episode drops. <laughs> yeah, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm Evie.Lupine on Instagram. And then I also have a Patreon where I do uh, live streams, bonus content, extra videos, all of that other stuff. Like Patreon is what keeps me doing all this wonderful educational content. But most of my stuff is on YouTube. That's my my primary platform. Outstanding. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I I think our listeners will really appreciate it. And we appreciated talking to you too. This was absolutely fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me on. If anyone has any questions, they can reach out to me on those platforms. And thank you again so much for having me. And I'm excited to see what the people have to say about this episode. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So thank you listeners for being here. We will See you again this time next week. Goodbye.